with technical analysis. Uh, copper, we did it last time, did we? Yeah. Alright, so what you see here is a major move up. We call this, and you can see it's actually for seven months, we call this a correction. So we have a six, seven months correction. So this easily qualifies for an intermediate correction. All right. So let's move on to the next chart. All right. Next chart, copper. You can see here in this copper chart a again a ten-year chart. Now you see how this is moving up. These bars in here it indicates an uptrend. You see a strength in here and indicates an uptrend. Again, you see yet another more strength in here. It represents by a rising up uh, here, it's going to be MACD, moving average convergence convergence. And yet you also see rising price. Now, another very important consideration that we are still in a copper bull market is that the 50, in this case, will be probably month moving average, is still well below. In other words, price is moving higher, the moving average is moving higher, and the price stays above the moving average. This is an indicator because it's a monthly chart of a secular bull market in copper. Once you see the price moving below this average, and you see also the average to start moving down, you have a major doubt or even confirmation that the secular bull market is over. So far, the hypothesis is that it's not. So far, there's a possibility you can see that copper uh, comes back, meaning corrects again to 250 or even 200, and the bull market will be still intact. Let's move on to the next chart. All right, so Commodity Research Bureau Index. So Commodity Research Bureau is an institution uh, which provides research on commodities. What they have designed is a index, that index originally is of equally weighted 15 different commodities, and each commodity comes with an equal weight in the index, and it gives you an indicator of the price level of commodities. Prices of commodities are usually good indicators of future inflation to come. In other words, uh, rising price inflation in commodities indicates rising uh, price inflation for the overall economy. In other words, a general price inflation, usually with some lag. So, you see here these bands here are sometimes known as Bollinger Bands. So, when you have this type of behavior, sometimes you have Bollinger Bands. These are, you see they're smoother, so the smoother the Bollinger Band, the longer the term. So, you have here a fairly long-term uh, bottom, again long-term bottom, again long-term bottom. Now, you have here the intermediate swings. In other words, these thin blue lines inside represent shorter term Bollinger Bands. These shorter term Bollinger Bands track the price and they tell you that you are intermediate correction down or upward trend. So this shows you the intermediate cycles and you can see you have enough swing here, and you have one, two, three, four, five legs right. So one, two, three legs up, and two corrections on the downside. Okay? So that's the one piece. Another piece here is the Commodity Research Bureau Index. Now, first of all, notice this is 2004. 2004 commodities have already been in a secular bull market for like three, four years. What you see here is a cyclical, within the secular, you have a cyclical bull run, it may have started a little earlier, you have a cyclical bull run from 04 all the way to 06. So, you had one cyclical bull market, and that cyclical bull market has a bear market, cyclical bear market within the context of a bull market. 
those that just came in from my previous class and listened to Jim Rogers, one of the top technicians and uh, secular investors, he clearly indicated he expects another 5, 10, possibly 15 years for the secular bull market in commodities to continue. Of course, he may be wrong, but that's the hypothesis that we're all, or assume, or work in hypothesis. So, what is this telling us? Yes, we had two good years of a cyclical bull, then we had a cyclical correction from the top in February 06 all the way here to the bottom in December 06. So what you got here is a 10-month commodity correction. You could call this even a cyclical correction. So they might be moving on the way up. Now what the author is also trying to tell you is that there is some relationship between the yield is on the 10 year note and this but I'm not going to do this part today. This is called intermarket analysis. So intermarket analysis tries to compare the returns and performances on different markets. Possibly a commodity market with some financial asset market, maybe with a bond market, maybe with a stock market. So this is what intermarket analysis is, but I don't want to get, get today into intermarket analysis. Let's move on and see what's next. All right, so here you see zoomed out the same CRB, so Commodity Research Bureau Index. You also see that on stock charts, these indices have a dollar sign at the top, a dollar sign. So you go to stockcharts.com, you type CRB and you can see the chart. We'll get probably a couple of lectures from now, we'll do some real-time charts and actually see how it went all the way to the beginning of 2008. So, the point I'm trying to make is, yes, you had in 2001 a correction cyclical, probably you can consider this the bottom of the secular bear market that started in 1980, I mean, it could be 99, I mean, it's different interpretations, and the first major bull run, or we call it the first leg, is beginning at 2002 and ends in somewhere April of 2006. So I have one, two, three, four and a half years of a cyclical, steady bull market. What else? You are here at 180, almost 190 on the CRB. Over here at the end, you're at 380. In other words, you put in your money here, in good four years, your money doubles. This can't happen well. Could not have happened on the US stock market, and it could not have happened on the US bond market. If you had invested in China, you would have gotten better returns, okay, on the Shanghai index. If you had invested in the Bulgarian stock market, you would have also gotten better returns. I mean, we are in a bubble, they are in a stock market bubble, there's a whole different story I don't want to get into. So what this is telling us here, the MACD, is that after you have had this huge run-up in the long-term MACD from 2002 to 2006, you have the correction. Now, here is something else. See how the MACD, each bar gets bigger, 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 and at the beginning of 2007, the bars begin to move up. When the bars begin to move up, it is a, a fairly safe territory to make an intermediate move. It would be best to have a confirmation. The confirmation will be when this lower crosses and starts moving up and when the red crosses and starts to move up. Let's look at it right in here. So, you could have made the move in here. It starts to move up. It comes positive. So, here at this point, when this big moves above and the bars get positive, so one goes up, the second goes up, the bars get positive, and the price is positive. This is a strong confirmation that the downtrend coming from before is most likely over. Again, 
It's important to understand that these are most likely monthly from what I look. And if you have monthly, you're looking at a long-term analysis and only long-term investments. It is not helpful for short-term trading at all. And very likely not very helpful for intermediate investors. In other words, if you're just trying to invest for two or three months, get in, get out, get in, get out, that's not the tool. This is the wrong tool for the job. But if you're just like Joe Blow, who's got some money, who can put in for two years or three years, tries to get a decent point, that would have been a great point. Here, you can see a great point. So over here, probably around late 2007, you could get the confirmation that the cyclical bear is over. We sometimes simply call it the correction is over and that you're back into bull mode. All right, let's move on and see what's next. All right, so what's WTIC? WTIC is actually crude oil. It's Texas Intermediate Crude Oil. That's how it's called. Uh, you have it here. Wait, 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 what's the year? Like, okay, so the year is 2007. So April of 2007, to March. So March, okay, May 26 to April 2007. You see where the guy, the technician, put in round 64. He put in here a support resistance. So what he tried to show you is some technical stuff. Not really helpful, and with these lines is not a great chart. Let's move on and see better things that we have here. All right, this is one of the most important charts in long-term investing. First of all, it is 1930 all the way to 2004. That's number one. So we got a 70, 80 year chart. This is a perfect chart for secular analysis, which we will do later in cyclical uh, analysis. So what you got to see is that in these 70 years, the ratio is between Dow Jones and gold. Dow Jones in the sim is the symbol of financial assets and represents the strength of financial assets. Gold is symbolic of the strength of real assets. So, this provides the strength of financial assets relative to real assets. One of the important lessons of this 70 or 8 year chart, chart is that society and the investment world in general shifts in trends and in some trends gold is a good investment and in other trends financial assets or Dow is the better investment. You can see the ratio moves roughly from almost 1 all the way to 25 and at the peak of the stock market dot com bubble all the way to 40. All right. So what you see is that you've had here this. It's interesting that in 1920 it was very high. So from 1920 it started falling. What? Why 1920? Let's explain that. It's very simple. World War I runs from 1914 to 1919, 1919 it's over. Fed has generated or created a lot of money in a wild inflation of credit expansion in order to finance World War I, meaning America's involvement in World War I. So the Fed being very cautious back then in 1920 about inflation, it induced a credit contraction. Credit contraction drove the economy into a recession, 1920-1921 recession. The recession was so sharp and so severe that by the time the government figured out nine months later that the economy is in deep trouble, by the time they decided to do something about it, because back then government wasn't as big and wasn't as fast, so it took them nine months to figure out what was going on. By the time they created or devised the plan, the recession was so sharp and severe, it was over. And the economy recovered. The point is that the res recession was over and the stock bear market was over in 2021. 20 so from 21 all the way to 29, 
The Dow Jones rose and rose dramatically against gold. Gold was at that time just fixed at $20 per ounce because the dollar was convertible to gold and the dollar was, oh sorry, the US was on a dollar standard. So the point is from 1920 you know, to 1930 was a good investment, actually it's got to be this way around, and from 1929 is the beginning of the Great Depression. At the beginning of a Great Depression, we just call it a bust, you'd better be in gold, meaning you'd better be out of financial assets. So, you have your here the bottom, this is one cyclical bottom, but it is important to understand that the secular market was over, you can see, all the way to 1942. So, here Dow didn't do much and gold didn't do much. The economy was lingering. So, from here, 1942, you have a wild, let's call it paper market, in other words, bull market in financial assets. Dow rose and rose against gold, as you can see, from 5 to 36, 7 times. So, from 42 roughly, all the way to peaking at 66 or so, this makes 25 years rise of financial assets. So, have a 25 year bull market in stock, secular. Now, because you have the bull market, it is easy, very easy to see that you had one correction in 54, another correction in 58, another correction in 60 or so, yet another correction here before the trend turned down. Now, what else can we see? Well, peaking around 66, I'd rather say, well, the chart says a little earlier than that, but 66 sounds good for us. From 66 all the way, it bottomed in 80, around 80, 82. So from 66 to 82, you have a 16 year secular, 16 year secular bull market in commodities and respectively secular bear market in financial assets. From 80 all the way to 1999, you see the peak, you see that Financial assets have outperformed gold roughly 40 times. The implication will be that when the time comes, you should expect gold to outperform the Dow within the next secular bear market roughly 40 times. In other words, the ratio here uh, goes back to 1 or 2, here goes back to 1 or 2, it's fair to say or expect that you're going to get back to 1 or 2. Of course, some guys go a step further, meaning a step backward. They try another 100 years from 1800 to 1900 to see how well this relationship holds and they've confirmed that it holds fairly well, that it's a fair relationship. So, this is what the expectation is. If now it takes roughly 15 uh, ounces of gold to buy one unit of Dow, do you guys understand this Dow gold ratio? I mean, Dow Jones is like 12,000, right? And gold is like 900. When you divide 12,000 by 900, it takes roughly 12, 13 ounces of gold to buy one unit of Dow Jones. So, if it's 12 now, you can expect it by the end of the secular bear market for stocks or the secular bull market for gold, that gold will outperform from here on roughly 10 times Dow Jones. All right? So, depending on the inflationary environment, is the US going to experience uh, deflation or stagflation or strong inflation? You may get, because the ratio is going to be close to one, that Dow Jones, let's say 10 years from now, will be 10,000, done nothing, and gold will be 10,000. In a strong deflation, Dow Jones can go down to 2,000, and gold will go up to 2,000. But in very strong inflation, the expectation is that Dow Jones can easily go down to 40,000, but Gold will go up to 40,000, all right? And then you got to think, well, Jesus, if gold's going to go up to 40,000, how much is oil going to be, all right? 
well, easily well over a thousand, right? All right, so that's good enough. Let's move on. See what else we got. What we got here is uh, XAG. They, 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 these are some, uh, I think, silver stocks. Where they're trying to tell you, well, this is the idea here is how this guy draws the trend lines. You see here the secular trend channel. That's the secular trend channel. And he draws some other from bottom here to bottom, again from top to bottom. So you see what the formation of this guy the charting is. But the idea is fairly straightforward. You got the first run up, and then you have your consolidation here. You got a major second run up, and then you have your consolidation. And then you have a third run up all the way to 16 something. This is probably has to do with silver. Yeah, that's franc and silver because that's what silver looked like. Silver like four dollars in 2001, two and three, and is was around 60 days. So that's some sort of a silver index for the silver price. And you can see how silver actually, if you were here, silver lingered and did nothing since 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. So. What is important to understand is it's hard to pick the, the real bottom. And you could get to invest for three years and the investment will do nothing. I started investing big time in silver right in here around 475. My silver now is 17. So it is almost quadruple in roughly you know, four or five years. Fairly decent investment. All right, let's move on and see what's, what's next. All right, Gold Corp is a miner in gold mining. So it is not a major company, but over the years, over the last three or four years, it has made some acquisitions. It has moved to an intermediate. Now he is more, uh, let's say, uh, moving into the majors category. And this just tells you, you see, for the last 10 years, it just tells you what the price behavior is. You see, it ran up from 95, but it had a back, pull back again. So from 96, all the way you see here to 2000, the stock did nothing and mostly lost your money. Now, the bottom is somewhere in here, at least technically the guy wants to draw it in here. He's drawn this one, I would have drawn this one like this and this one parallel like this, and you can see the trend channel. So, one of the important things to understand is technical analysis, that sometimes if you have five different technicians, they will provide for you five different interpretations of the chart. They'll draw the chart in very different alternative ways. So, I would not have drawn it personal like this, I would have drawn it here, and then I would have drawn it with a trend channel over here, and you know, watch the trend channel. Again, different people, different preferences. Well, how does this contradict with what I was saying about Dow Jones, sorry, Dow theory that was contradicting, or you know, different interpretations. With Dow theory, things are fairly strict. I'm not teaching you Dow theory now. I'm giving you different interpretations, different views, of different technicians. So, Dow theoreticians, if you get three or five of them, very likely they will agree on what's the picture. I mean, it doesn't mean I will agree or some other technician will agree. All right, see, see the difference? Is it, is it clear? All right, let's uh, move. So, what, what else? 2001, you can see the EMEA, that's the moving average, that's relative price. You can see there has been rising. So, there has been some channel that indicates to this particular technician, well, the technician is called Stefan Bogner up there. So this is the guy who actually uh, made this chart. All right, let's move on and see what's next. All right, this is, again, the price of gold. You'll be seeing many more. I kind of like to follow uh, the gold market. Uh, so what you see here, again, is coming from stockcharts.com. So you should be able to go to stockcharts.com and replicate it up to real time if you like. So first of all, what do we have here? We have uh, 2004 through 2007. Again, you see four or five years of gold prices. You see one trend channel here, a uh, trend line here. You have a 
slightly steeper trend line over there. What you also see is you have a 20 and 65. That 20 and 65 looks to me like it is weekly. So we have weekly trend lines. And you can see how the 65 weekly moving average has been a very strong and very reliable support. So every time it touches the 65 moving average, it springs up above it. Same thing happened here, springs above it. Same thing happens here. Same thing here. And again here, and possibly down the road if you continue to reconstruct it. So, what this guy is trying to tell us, as far as I've read it and remember it from a while ago, it's like half a year ago, is that for this guy, the 65-week moving average appears to be the better working support for the price of gold. So he follows that one. And then there is the other one, but it's, you know, a different 20-week moving average. That's roughly 100-day moving average. For 100 days, what isn't doing such a good job. You can also see here the same bars and some correction. So over, somewhere over here you might be in good shape to enter. Somewhere over here you might be also in good shape to enter. Again, you see that what this chart tells you without looking at this chart tells you this is probably a very good place to enter. Chart, this chart here tells me somewhere in here is a very good place to enter. Well, right in here without even looking gives you 600. So you would have entered at 600 based on this one here and now is roughly 900. This simply means that you have made for a year and three months from 600 to 900 you would have made good 50%. Good 50% is really good for 15 months. Alright, let's move on and see what's next. Alright, so Similar, we're looking at chart, that's the silver continuous contract. Again, uh, most likely have the 20 week moving average and 65 week moving average. Again, the same old story, the 65 week moving average is a very strong support. Remember, it touches and goes underneath, but this is not considered a violation because we need two three or four percent to go beyond and we don't have three or four percent violation if you don't have three or four percent violation then it is still holding as support so you can you can also look at in here this is a good entry point this is been a good entry point this would have been here a good entry point and indeed i mean now here is a 10 that's in 2006 now it's a 17 that's a fairly good return. 70% for roughly two years is still a very good return. All right, let's move on, see what's next. All right, this is a gold chart again, 2006, 2007. Uh, now, you can actually read this guy's interpretation. Gold has been shepherded higher in recent months by the uptrend shown, uh, you know, the long-term moving average. So, not so far uh, beneath, you know, however, the fact that April is on. And now, he uses another technical indicator called the COT figures. That's Commitment of Traders Reports. So, this is gold continuous contract. What does it mean? Continuous contract. Continuous contract means that this is gold and price is taken out of the futures market. When you have a price on the futures market, continuous price on the futures market means that you take the month before expiration. When the month expires on that date, you switch to the next month before it expires. In other words, for every month you take the price of that month before it expires, on the day of expiry, you take the next month. And you take the continuous price of the future, it's called sometimes ro rolling over continuous price. So this is the price that they are taking. This is the futures market. If it's the future market, it has to have, by US law, a commitment of trader's report. Commitment of trader's report is a report which Everybody above certain size positions, let's say 100 contracts, must 
report to the CFTC, Commodities Futures Trading uh, Commission. So this is the regulator, everybody about a certain point, they certain size, they get a report there. They are classified in three categories in the COF report. They're classified in funds and investments. They are classified in hedgers. Now, one of the one categories is investors and uh, speculators. In the other head category is the hedger category. These are investment banks and miners that hedge. And then you have small non-reportable positions. So based on the dynamics and the buying power of the speculators and the hedge funds, which is the first category, and based on the selling behavior of the second category, known officially and technically as commercials, and also on the small fish, the little guys, which are the third category called the non-reportables, by their buying and selling behavior, you could deduce where the market might be. In other words, if the funds are very net long, the hedge funds are very net long, this means that for every long position, they must post a margin. If they have excessive net long positions, this means that they are out of margin money. This means that they are out of buying firepower. If they are out of resources and they don't have any more margins to post, they can't buy anymore. If they can't buy anymore, the only thing left is selling. So, this is the meaning and the interpretation of this COT report. And the basic idea is that this guy is using a separate, completely different technical indicator to deduce further logic. Another thing, you see number one, number two, number three, these are called fan lines. So, you take one peak point, one fan line, correction, second fan line, another correction, third fan line. Fan lines are classical tool of Dow theorists, Dow technicians. They love to use this approach of fan lines. And once you run through three fan lines, and you still have the support holding, very likely the correction is over. In other words, this was a peak, and you had a correction. So the peak represents resistance, and yet the market is strong. So what this guy is telling us, hey, even though the gold market has been churning since, what is this, April of 2006, all the way to 2007, this is called a high level consolidation. The gold bull market is still intact, the secular bull market is still intact, and very likely to continue. Well, you know, from you, you were asking before. Now we know that the market continued because we now know at the beginning of 2008 that it is already 900. Again, technical analysis works most of the time, but not always. Any investor who can get it out of technical analysis 60% right and 40% wrong will do well in the markets. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, so this one is showing you, I showed you before again, gold. And you can see here, 1971, I was explaining last time, you had a huge run from 1970, it's actually from 66 or 68, depending on, you know, all the way to 79. You also see where the bubble is. I mean, you don't need econometrics and econometric analysis to tell where the bubble begins. The bubbles, you see, this is a major runner, and somewhere over here, it goes, goes vertical. So, the bubble is clear after January 79, and you can see it all the way to January 80. That was the bubble. In the previous hour, we are talking about Jim Rogers. He gets to see the skyrocketing price. He says, oh, yeah, we are in a bubble. We'd better get out while the getting out is good, okay, before the bubble has collapsed on us. Well, you can see it did collapse in one leg. It second collapsed on a second leg. It collapsed on a third leg. It collapsed four leg. It collapsed five legs. So, when we're looking at the secular bull market for gold, you see one major leg up, 
One major cyclical leg down. The cyclical leg down was down for almost two years. It weared out all bulls that were bullish on gold, but not believing in it. So anyone who bought in here, the bulls wearing it, and they give up and then you get the final burst. Notice that the final burst was three years. So three years get, getting you from 100 to 800. So if you increase or make money eight times in three years, that's really good money. Of course, you can't pick this bottom, and of course you can't pick the top, but if you pick somewhere in here around 150 and you sell into the four, five, six hundred level, you triple your money in three years, you're in great shape, all right? So, uh, what else? Again, I mentioned, first leg down, second leg down, third leg down, then another recovery. So, these here are called recovery. In a secular bear market, it is also properly called a correction. So, again, second down, third down, fourth down, and finally, this is the devastating fall in here, it makes new all-time, well, at least for the secular bear market, uh, low of 250, you make it once here, you make it second time here, we call this, if you remember, I explained last time, called a double bottom, and then the secular bull market is on again. I mean, you gotta splice them in your mind and kind of get to remember the chart, I mean, you do better if you have a visual memory of gold's price for the full 20th century. And of course, Dow Jones price. So at any point in time, you got a rough idea where the one was and where the other was and what was the environment. Of course, it will be even nicer if you knew where the recessions were and where were, you know, the economy was strong. So all of these relationships do help. And that's how you get to learn the markets. All right, what's next? Australian dollar versus gold. In other words, what's coming out of here is the following major concept. You just don't want to see the price of the gold in dollar terms. There may be something fundamentally wrong with the dollar, and the price of gold may be rising simply because the dollar is falling. What we want to see, if we're going to be investing in gold, we want to see gold rising not against the dollar, not against the Turkish lira, but against the good, strong currencies of the world, which are these, at least for the last couple of years. Well, these are the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, the Hong Kong dollar, the Singaporean dollar, the Canadian dollar, certainly not the British pound, certainly not the US dollar, all right? Also strong currency has been for a while the euro. So what you want to check if you're in the gold market is you want to see how gold is performing against other strong currency. And if gold is performing up against all other currency, then gold is clearly a good investment, all right? So, the look now is an Australian dollar. Again, you see the same 20 year bear market. You see now that the Australian dollar is actually bottom here in 97. So, remember when I was saying that the secular bull market was in 99 or 2000? Well, the lesson to learn is that you'd better look in a bunch of currencies because you take the Australian dollar, the picture looks very different, all right? So every time you look at it from a different currency, the picture looks different. So what is the best currency to look at? Well, the best currency to look at is gold. You want to look everything else in terms of gold because gold is the most stable of all currencies. All right, so what you have here, it tells you, okay, it's bottomed up. You got here, this is what we call a breakout. So it's breaking out of this super long-term secular uh, resistance level. It's breaking out. You have a triangle consolidation. It is 
most likely going to move higher? Well, it probably did. We can take a look some other time, not today, to see what happened. This is coming out of Gold Money, James Turk, Turk's website. Probably more will be coming. Let's see what else. All right, so you see now gold in Canadian dollars. You see a similar picture. For once, there has been one big secular resistance. You see again from 1980. You also see the Canadian dollar, same story. 98 bottomed out. So from 98, it's moving steadily up. So you see one breakout here, and again, gets back to the support. You have a different, and it is getting up, and you see again the same old story. Well, we now know gold's going way higher than this against the Canadian dollar. But the idea is, okay, gold is going up against the US dollar, it's going up against the Australian dollar, it's going up against the Canadian dollar. Let's see what's next. Uh, that will be Euro. So, this is Euro. DM stands for Deutschmark. So, before there was Euro, there were Deutschmark. So, what you want to do is grab it against Deutschmarks and then splice as the Euro you know, comes into existence and the Deutschmark. So, what you see here is a long, steady consolidation of roughly from 92 all the way to 2003. So, the real breakout of gold was in 2003 or 2004. It is associated with a phenomenal acceleration in the money supply growth of the Eurozone. You can be shocked at the correlation between money supply growth, broad money supply Euro of the Eurozone, which was very low and very stable, and since 2004, money supply growth has shot up substantially. All right, so when I mean, you can make those correlations, so uh, gold in euro is tracking nicely the money supply uh, of the euro. All right, so let's see what's next. All right, so British pound against gold. As you can see, that British pound has been falling. Again, a similar chart. Uh, gold's been going up against the British pound for now good 10 years in terms of British pound. Gold is in a bull market. Again, same story. You can see here how it big bottom. I mean, these charts get to look very similar. That's very important to understand. Let's see what's next. All right, what's next is a very interesting chart. That's the yen against the gold. Uh, yen has been a chosen currency for the yen carry trade, which we cover in my other course. And in the yen carry trade, you borrow yen because of its low interest rate. You sell the yen, and then you buy some higher yielding currency. And in the process of that, you're effectively selling and depressing the yen, so the yen is weak. But when the time comes to unwind the yen carry trade, that will artificially strengthen. So, when the yen carry trade goes on and accumulates, it artificially lowers the yen. And when it unwinds, it strengthens the yen. The point here is that you have some yen carry trade and yen has been fairly stable. Actually, what you can see here, the price has gone up from 1 to 3. So, the price tripled in just a 5 or 6 short years. I mean, you all know that yen has been weaker than the dollar. So, whatever it did in dollar terms, it would certainly do better in yen terms. Alright, let's see what's next. Alright, that's against Indian rupee. See how phenomenally weak the rupee is. Rupee is one of the best examples of a weak currency, of a terribly weak currency. <coughs> Gold went up here. Yes, there was a tiny little, tiny little bit on the way down. You see the triangle. Gold bottom in 85, in 86 against the rupee. And then has been going steadily up. What this is simply telling you, of course, this is not the correct interpretation. The correct interpretation is the exact opposite. That the rupee has been steadily and steadily falling against the dollar. All the way for the last 20, how many? 
three years from 85 to 2008. Actually, so the Indians were printing and printing and printing and stimulating and stimulating the loss of currency. You can actually see how many times all the way from almost 100 to almost 1000. So the rupee has fallen against, doll, uh, uh, against gold 10 times. Well, no wonder Indians have been buying gold steadily for the last two decades. I mean, their currency is falling so much against gold that they better, whenever they get the currency, meaning the rupee, they immediately buy the gold, all right? I mean, they also have some cultural reasons and uh, other stuff. I don't want to get into the, uh, you know, about marriages and all this kind of stuff into the... Guys are laughing there. And, 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 uh, and Indian culture, right? I mean, if you're going to be getting married in, 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 in India, you can, you can get with you only your gold stuff that's on you. I mean, if you're the, the, the wife. So, you'd better have a lot of gold because that's the only one you can keep there. But it's cultural stuff from thousands of years. Let's move on. Let's move on. Alright, so you also see the Swiss franc and also see that ultimately the Swiss could not hold the strength of their currency. So what you see that the Swiss uh, franc has been one of the strongest currencies in the world yet up until 2004 they have been holding steadily. Ultimately in 2004 we don't say gold broke up against the Swiss franc. The correct saying is that the Swiss franc collapsed against gold. Alright? So, essentially, now we have meaningful doubts about the long-term strength of the Swiss franc. So, some people ask, well, is, is the Swiss franc a good investment? The answer is yes, when you compare it against the dollar or Bulgarian lead. But when you compare it to gold, no way, you know. So better is get gold than Swiss francs. Of course, it's nice to have some of our portfolio in gold, which will be relatively less liquid, and some more of your portfolio in Swiss francs, which are infinitely more liquid. Oh, I started a new discussion on portfolio construction. This whole stuff here that they're talking about, you know, about stocks versus bonds, and, you know, this is nonsense. That's not how Real is done. I mean, real good guys do it against liquidity. You want a lot of, a lot of gold and oil. There, no, this gold is not very well liquid. So you want to keep some real currency in liquid form. Maybe the currency itself. Maybe bonds, but bonds might be dangerous. Why? Because yields may rise due to inflation. And if yields rise, you can actually lose in your bonds. All right. So the way to think about it is, okay, 70% of my money will be in gold and silver, and 30% will be just in pure currency for liquidity reasons. If I really need to do something, you know, pay immediately for an operation surgery, I don't know what might happen, I want to have some currency, Swiss francs or euro or whatever. So that's the way to think about it. That's how they think about in terms of portfolio. That's how they think about in terms of diversification. You want to go all the spectrum from highly liquid assets to highly liquid currencies. And that's a better dimension, the liquidity dimension within your portfolio than say bonds and risky stocks. Well, bonds aren't really safe. I mean, <laughs> yield now is like 3.6% on a 10-year US government bond. Well, what's going to happen when long bonds uh, yield rise to 10%? Well, the bond itself is going to get crushed, meaning you're going to be suffering phenomenal losses. Bonds are no way to be safe if they're not safe. Say, well, you can get just three month bond and then three month again and roll over three months. Sure, if that's the case and just keep rolling three months after three months, well, how much are you going to get in terms of return on that bond? 2%, right? 2.5%, that's how much you can get. No big deal. 2% annually is nothing like compared to 30% on low. Let's move on. Alright, so gold in US dollars, London weekly, that's probably the same chart. Yeah, that's in US dollars. Again, you can see bottom down to 99, you can see here, it's been steadily rising. Uh, again, the consolidation triangle, we've seen this chart in a sense, let's move on. 
Let's see what's left. Okay, HUI. HUI is a fairly important index. The HUI is the index. How do they call it? Yes, they call it the Gold Bugs Index. Gold Bugs Index is the index of unhedged gold stocks. So, unhedged gold stocks means unhedged major gold mining stocks. So, you just don't want to see how gold itself is performing. What you want to see is how the gold mining stocks are performing and possibly even performing against gold. If gold mining stocks are outperforming, you get one interpretation. If not, a different interpretation. This is another example of intermarket analysis. You get the gold commodity itself, one market, and you get gold mining stocks, which are stocks, it's a financial asset versus real asset. So that's how people analyze it. Well, you see here 06, 07, they had their upward trend. You also see here a downward trend. So what the author is telling us, and here it is, the hypothesis is that it will eventually break up on the way and that will confirm the bull market for gold and possibly for gold stock. Or if it breaks down, you got to have severe doubts of the gold bull market. So again, you got to have a working hypothesis. The working hypothesis gold is in a secular bull market and you're looking for signs that confirm or deny. Remember what I said uh, probably in the first lecture about uh, Dow theory or technical analysis? This is a perfect example. This is a time of indecision. It doesn't tell you it's going to continue up and it doesn't tell you it's going to continue down. But you will find out fairly soon which way it's going to break out, okay? So, again, you're in an indecision. When you're in indecision, remember what was the general rule is the trend holds. So, if you're in indecision, trend holds, you keep holding until you see breakdown. If not, you stay with the trend. Let's move on. Okay, so here's another one. This is the same stuff. It's a little different scale. Now I have it from 05 to 08. Uh, all gold bugs, meaning those people that are heavily invested in gold and are true believers in gold, were beginning to lose their faith because from 06, you can see all the way to mid 07, for a year and a half, their gold stocks have done nothing. So, people are, well, what's going on, what not? Well, here is that same formation. This is an example of what triangle? Ascending, ascending triangle. So you see the ascending triangle, you see also the resistance. This is a typical continuation pattern. You watch it closely and you watch it carefully and you see when it breaks out or down by more than two or three percent tolerance level. And once you see which way it goes, you either adjust your positions or if it goes down possibly get out of your positions or you see it goes up and say, okay, it's the bull market again, you load up some more. Again, see, it depends on what is your portfolio. Most importantly, what is your current cash position? If you got excess cash, you can load up. And if you don't have any cash, you don't do anything. Or if you don't have any cash, you find some other underperforming asset, you sell it out and, you know, increase the weight in your, of, your, uh, of gold in your portfolio. Let's see what's next. All right, next, that's the same HUI again. Here is an example of resistance area. Resistance area is also resistance zone. Great. Guys, we get back to the same stuff. All we're trying to do is illustrate these major fundamental, these major fundamental uh, technical developments and technical patterns. So it's one example. This is how this guy saw it here and this is what it is. So you see it holds, it holds, it holds. You can also say HUI is fourth attempt to slash through, it didn't work, maybe next time. All this kind of stuff you can read the interpretation. Alright, let's move on. See what else. Alright. 
This is I and the U to gold. So this is uh, Dow Jones Industrial Leverage against gold. Again, this is zooming from 1980 to 2006, 2007. Here, the key is the trend line. You see the peak here, the peak here cast down, but the real investment decision should be in 2001. You have a breakdown, a meaningful breakdown. Remember, it rallies back to the trend line and then starts falling steadily, meaning the Dow falls against gold. So over here you have a decent confirmation that the 20-year secular bull market in Dow Jones in financial assets is over and that you're into a commodity bull market, okay? So that's how they think, that's how they interpret it. What's next? Alright, so this is the XJY, that's the Japanese Yen. This is Japanese Yen Index, I think it's up against a couple of currencies. Uh, there are two of them. One is uh, the yen against the basket of currencies. Another one is the yen against the dollar alone, divided by 100, or just number of yen, 84 yen. I don't know which one is this in 2007. But again, the idea is the guy provides here short and long-term support area. He probably means that 5, 10, 20 years ago, that was a significant area. He tells you, okay, it held, and if it held, it went up, it's recovering. This type of configuration is a classical reverse configuration. When you see this type of configuration, it's going down, it ultimately breaks on the way up. Of course, may not be always true, but if it provides a correct signal 7% of the time, you're going to be making good money out of it. So, this is how this guy used it. Let's move on and see. Yeah, well, by the way, that was called falling wedge, the previous one. Falling wedge is the technical configuration. Again, you have here, uh, what is this? The, the Japanese yen, but that's against what? That's, that means that it's a May or March contract of 2007, Japanese yen. You, you see here the moving average. You see how it touched the moving average and it held down. You see here the support line, what is this, 83? That's got to be the previous 83 support line. And, and again, you just watch it, see how the guy drew the lines here. I mean, these are all illustrations of how recent, you know, how professionals recently use technical analysis. And you can see the moving average, 50 moving average, 200 day moving average, and that's 18 day moving average. All right, let's move on. All right, net gas is natural gas. Natural gas, that's in the United States. You will have very different divergent natural gas prices. The reason is that natural gas is not easily transportable. You cannot easily arbitrage. You cannot easily ship it from Europe to the United States. You need a natural gas, uh, it's called a terminal port. You got to liquefy it and compress it big time. On the other side, you got to degasify, convert it back from liquid to uh, gas again. Such a station costs roughly 40 to 50 billion dollars. In the United States, you got barely four of them. The point is that even if you have excess surplus in Europe or Russia or Kazakhstan or Qatar, and you have phenomenal shortage in the US, there is no way that you can ship it simply because you don't have enough, uh, enough uh, stations to, you know, to absorb it. They got only four. They can get so many tankers. So you can have huge price differentials in natural gas across the world. And this one simply represents in the U.S. market. So what this guy saw here was in the eight zone from roughly eight to 874, he saw an important curve, it fell below, it was holding once, it went second time, it went third time. So for this guy, the interpretation is, okay, the 8 area is a major resistance, until it breaks out of the 8, you shouldn't be bothering to invest in natural gas. In other words, there may be some other forces related to natural gas 
that are different from the overall commodity market or from the specifically crude oil market. I mean, for example, we have phenomenal excess supply uh, in Canada. And if Canadians produce an awful lot, they can't export it anywhere else. I mean, they gotta have the terminals to ship it. And on the other side, Bulgaria, whichever country, Japan's gotta have the terminals to accept it. So it may be that Canadians produce an awful lot of it, and they have no other outlet for their gas but the US market. So if that's the case, that may possibly depress. Okay, you see now what I used here? I used some basic fundamental analysis, some basic economics arguments behind reading the chart. And I was, you can read the chart and that's okay, but it better know how the natural gas market works. Not that I'm any expert, but I know the basics enough to know, you know how it works, what's going on. All right, let's move on. Oh, this is really hard to read. Uh, what, what, what is it? So over there you have the relative strength in this index. This is again relative strength. Again, this is what they tell you. I still can't see. This looks like silver North America. So this is, okay, you see it up there. North American silver. So this is a silver stock, North American silver. You see here the years. I don't see them really well what the years are, but again, this is how the guy used it. You see what was his technical analysis. You see some levels. Yeah, not a nice and easy chart. Let's move on to the next. All right, GC, that's again Gold Corp. And remember, we were looking at Gold Corp before. Uh, no, GC, that's not Gold Corp. That's, uh, yeah, that's the Gold Pit. So we're looking here at the price. That's probably the $300 price. That's the 255 price that bottomed out here in 2001. This is the 99 bottom of the gold market. So see how the guy made the one line, see how he made the other one, and this is called the internal trend line. So the internal trend line acted as a resistance early on, and then when it penetrated, it acted as a support. That this is this person's interpretation of the gold market. I mean, gold market technicians also have different interpretations. A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. I mean, other technicians would use that one. Uh, some third technicians would use Elliott Wave technical analysis. They will have one up, two down, three up, four down, five up, and then a correction phase. So different types of technicians will have their own interpretation. So here is this one. What was apparently important for this guy was that this particular uh, trend line was fairly important. Let's move on. Oh, this is nothing to do with a stock. This is actually personal savings in the United States from 59 to the present of when the chart was made. So the present for the chart was 2004. What you see here is a pure macroeconomic behavior. It is a long-term macroeconomic behavior, roughly 40, almost 50 years now. And you can see how the savings rate was down. It was uh, going up. It peaked somewhere over here. And you see there has been, in 91, a secular change. And it's been going down. Uh, it's interesting that it has gone down a lot further over the last uh, three or four years. There may be some other one. Uh, it, it's important to understand this is not a price chart. This is a pure macroeconomic chart of a fundamental macroeconomic variable. But some people like to use macro variables and for them to perform a technical analysis. So they go one step further. Again, whether this type of technical analysis on other stuff is legitimate or not will be a different point. You guys have had too much fun, two penalty points for you. And you might as well split two. All right, let's move on. E-mini S&P futures. So the E-mini S&P futures, you see what's going on here. This is for particular day. This is most likely, as far as I can see, minute by minute. What really happened here was, and if you're in the other class, you can see uh, 
total and complete collapse in here, then the market jiggles around, so the market collapses, gaps down, and then cold-blooded buyer, who might that be? It's called the PPT, the Plunge Protection Team. This is an organization that has been created by the order of the president in 1987 after the stock market uh, crash. It's called officially and technical the president's working group. It is main mission and objective is whenever there is a threat for a stock market or any other financial meltdown, it can act and buy as much as necessary to support the market and to support any sort of a meltdown. Well, how do they get their money? Where do they get their money from? Well, the answer is very simple. From the Fed itself. If they need a billion, they'll get it. If they need 50, they'll get it. If they need 100, they get it. Well, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is that if they keep buying and keep and keep buying and pumping a lot of money, they will certainly begin to distort market prices. Stock bond markets will be providing incorrect or phony signals and ultimately you keep doing this for a while and the market will not be functioning properly. In other words, the capital market's main purpose and main function is to allocate capital to its most efficient use, to its most profitable use. And if you support a specific asset, whether it's a, I don't know, a construction business or something else, you provide a phony signal that this asset is performing well. So, you keep distorting it for a while and investors will be throwing money at inefficient businesses before long you destroy the most important function of the capital market, the capital allocation function. So what you see here is after a few minutes or hours, the plunge protection team jumped in and started buying. They usually do it through the futures pits. Uh, it's, it's very convenient. Futures pits provides leverage. So you need only one billion to drive up 50 billion with, let's say, 1 to 50 uh, ratio. The leverage in the future splits is roughly 1 to 10. So you drive up and you support the market. How do you support the market? When you buy the futures, arbitrageurs will come around. They see the futures market going up. Arbitrageurs will be selling the futures market and buying the spot market. And this way, the central bank uh, via this plunge protection team can support the market. What this guy is doing is providing an indication of such intervention in the market. This has a well-known and well-coined term called a flagpole rally. Flagpole rally means he stays flat and suddenly the market shoots up in the sky. Usually it happens in the market around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there is something magic about 3 o'clock in the United States. That is, the market closes at 4. So, if it closes at 4, you'd better give yourself an hour to intervene. You'd better move in between 3 and 3.15. You buy up the market and then you get traders and everybody else piling on to your rally and they help out drive the market up. And if they drive the markets very strongly, then the PPT will reverse its position. I mean, remember, it's bought in here, so there's a strong buying up there. They will reverse its positions and cash out as a profit. So they would make a good profit. So if they have to take the loss, they will take the loss. The preferred solution is always after a couple hours or after a couple of days to unwind their positions completely. Again, they would better unwind their positions completely so as not to distort the market. So when the market is in trouble, helping it for an hour or two, for a day or two is fine, no problem. No major distortion. But once you put in more and more and more, a day after a day and a week after a week, what you get is accumulation of distortions and these will affect the long term. All right, let's see what's next. And how much time we got? 
You guys gotta show me the watch. All right, let's move around, see who's where.